Uh, ooh. I always forget about that cue. Okay, now, now we're official. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Ask the Experts panel on sound supervisors. Uh, my name's Katie Pagich. I want to be a sound supervisor when I grow up. So you can imagine my excitement to be here with these legendary sound supervisors. We have Marla McGuire, Annalie Blank, and Katie Wood. Everyone, give me some hands in the <laughs> reactions. Yeah. I love that feature. <laughs> um, so we've collected questions beforehand, uh, which I will be asking our esteemed panel panelists. And uh, feel free to, you know, put some things in the chat if uh, anything comes up that you want to ask. We'll do our best to get to it. And yeah, I think that about covers it. <laughs> cool. Uh, sorry, I'm going to go in this mode. Yeah. All right. So my first question, it's not my question, actually. It's from Petrushka Mirzva. It was directed to Annalie, but I'm going to open it up to the panel to get things rolling. How have y'all been? How are you guys doing? <laughs> Good. Good. Yep. Yeah. Hanging in there. <laughs> Katie, how you been? <laughs> Very well, thank you. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, it's uh, we want to like start at the beginning so everyone can kind of get familiar with uh, who these amazing panelists are. Let's get origin stories. I want to start at the beginning uh, and just talk about the timeline that took you into becoming uh, a sound supervisor. Marla, can we start with you? Okay. Um, well, I grew up in San Diego and um, I had a lot of energy. So my mom put me in dance class. And so as a kid, I was a dancer and an actor and I was an only child. And I, I realized at some point that I would, I didn't really like being the center of attention like on stage, but I wanted to do things behind the scenes. I still wanted to be creative. Um, so I took a class in technical television um, in junior high and high school and started getting into like broadcast engineering and video production, that kind of stuff. Uh, was working for the PBS station in San Diego because I went to San Diego State and that was on the campus. Um, and then I got a job uh, actually on a production crew for a, a HBO show that was filming in Del Mar. Um, and I kept in touch with the production mixer and the boom guy. And I got a job in LA at a place called Compact Video. Um, doing broadcast engineering, uh, tape playback, that kind of stuff. And um, that got me in the union, because at the time you could either be 695 or 776. And then that production mixer, Steve Nelson, called me and said, because he knew I wanted to be a sound editor, because I decided that that sounded really, really cool, just to do everything with sound. Because um, also in college, uh, my boyfriend was getting a degree in um, uh, theater sound. Um, and so I just fell in love with everything he was doing and kind of became the sound person on student films. So cut to Steve calls me and says, hey, the union's teaching a class transitioning from uh, tape to computer to try to teach sound editors the new digital world. Um, do you want to take the class? And I said, well, I'm not a sound editor. And he said, well, they don't know that. And I said, do you mean lie? <laughs> and he said, no, just, just call them up. They probably won't even ask. So I did and I got in the class and the class was at Sony Studios uh, being taught by a dialogue editor. And I was fascinated by the non-destructive way that it all went down. And, and uh, I was recommended to the head of Sony as somebody who might kind of be able to pick it up. Um, and so me and like 10 other people had like a little probationary um, trial where I was working 20 hours a day because I was working at Compact Video in Burbank and then running down <laughs> working in Culver City. Um, and so I basically I learned the box. I didn't know anything about the creative aspect. So I learned exactly what to do. Um, and then ultimately kind of made my way up because I really wanted to direct when I was uh, at San Diego State. And um, what I find now, just jumping to today for one second, that I kind of am directing, but I'm directing my portion of the show, you know, and then I'm working with the actors. So that's kind of like directing, although they can't know 
that I'm directing now. <laughs> um, and um, for some reason, I can't hear you right now, Katie, when you're laughing and stuff. Yeah. Oh, do you want to hear my laugh? I always mute myself, like, because oh, no, my laugh okay. is so obnoxious. Yeah. <laughs> no, but it, it just was throwing me off because it looked like you were making noise and I wasn't hearing you. Um, so at Sony, I started out on Mad About You, uh, cutting dialogue, well, as an assistant, and then cutting dialogue and then cutting the effects, um, the original Mad About You. And um, so by then I knew all the producers of Mad About You. So when the slot came open to supervise, um, they gave me a shot. And so from there, I kind of moved up. I, I um, just got different opportunities and uh, kind of made my way up. And that was like 20 years ago. That's awesome. Thanks, Marla. Bravo. <laughs> uh, Anna Lee, what's your origin story? Um, well, sometimes I, even today, I go, is this really my job? <laughs> You're paying me for this? This is so weird. Um, I never really knew that there was obviously any sort of job in this sort of expertise. Um, I also was a dancer. Um, I danced professionally for many years and then the conductor of the orchestra showed me Pro Tools because we were doing some matinees and we were taking out an, an act from our dance. And at that time I was very into um, recording my own concerts I would go to and making tapes for my friends. Um, I got injured in ballet and my friends at the time were like, you're really techie and you love music. Maybe you should learn how to record musicians. And I go, yeah, maybe I could be a professional groupie. I wonder if that could be a job. And so I moved to Los Angeles and went to this very small tech engineering school. No Pro Tools, everything was on two inch tape. And I started working um, in different music studios around the Los Angeles area. Um, worked with a ton of great bands. Got a lot of experience doing that. I loved it. Um, I did not love invoicing record labels and really saw that it was challenging to, if I'm just getting into it now, what's the business of the music industry gonna look like in 15 years? So my friend was Danny Elfman's personal assistant and said, hey, you should come work with this guy, Danny. He needs some help in his studio. And I go, who? <laughs> and um, so I Googled him and I go, oh, he seems neat. So I went to his house and I worked at his, at his house studio and I built a studio at his other place um, in Santa Barbara. And we worked on Charlie and the Chocolate Factory and Corpse Bride. And we went to London and worked at Air Studios and recorded the, tons of his songs. He's an amazing lyricist. And it really opened my eyes to a film and that it is creative and there's all these other aspects of making a movie that something that would, I didn't even realize, you know, and you can still be a musician and still have this creative outlet. Um, I didn't really wanna be his music editor or go that route. Um, I kind of wanted to make my own way. So he helped me get a job at Tadio. He wrote a letter for me and it was a little bit of an ego boost when I first started working at Tadio's. <laughs> I think I worked in the vault for about three months. And I remember I going to my boss and I said, I, I, I'm gonna move up. I wanna be a mixed tech. And he goes, well, you need to be in the vault for, you know, some people are in the vault for two years. I was like, really? Cause logging tapes makes you a better engineer. And he did not really like that answer. Um, so I did it anyway. And I was out of the vault uh, my fourth month and started being a mixed tech and didn't really know what I was doing, but I had a lot of help from some friends and failed sometimes and also cried in front of the console. And then started working with indie filmmakers. Um, one actually knocked on my door. He had no money and we mixed his movie for free at Tadio. And he just went on to make a Marvel movie, which Katie and I just worked on together. I did not sound supervise that. That's more Katie's uh, wheelhouse there. Um, but I love sound supervising. Um, I don't do it a ton because uh, 
I guess I'm doing it a little bit more and more, even though I'm like, no, I, I'm not doing that. But I love to mix and I like to sound supervise when the people are nice because that's where you can be the most creative. And if I can work with Katie, you know, she's pretty nice. So I keep pretending you're talking about me. I'm like, yeah, <laughs> Katie would, Katie would. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, depending on how you're oriented. Uh, Katie, other Katie, um, what's your origin story? Uh, yeah, so um, thank you, Anneli. Love working with you too, by the way. <laughs> the awkward. But, um, like. <laughs> but uh, I'm originally from New Zealand and, you know, it's a bit of a different sort of uh, situation there and when um i started out i used to work in um worked in a lot of bars and restaurants and stuff and um or cafes rather and a lot of venues and i was interested in the music side of things and um but wasn't just really didn't have any kind of background that i thought was applicable to the music side of you know live mixing so then um i had some uh, i had quite a few mates who worked in film and stuff and i'd always been interested in sound and various sorts of things. And so I started out um, basically shadowing a boom opera uh, as a second boom operator to a location recordist in New Zealand. I did that, you know, in, in my own time for a year or two and sort of realized that it wasn't that creative, but, you know, at least, you know, with what I wanted to do. And then um, I got, um, but I did get quite a bit of experience in it. And then I just sat in with um, people when they were uh, located, um, you know, uh, sound editing and um, stuff and just watched what they did, not really understanding exactly what was going on, but sort of got the gist of it, I guess, just by watching. And then, um, and then I was, you know, people took pity on me, saw that I wasn't going away and uh, gave me a job as an assistant on a film. And um, from there, I sort of really picked up a knowledge base and stuff. And then uh, went back and did doing quite a bit of location recording as well for commercials and stuff like that. And work ran out in New Zealand as, uh, cause it's a small industry when Peter Jackson's not doing anything, it's, it's pretty tiny. You know, we're talking eight to 12 films a year. So you have to supplement your sound career with, you know, any aspects of sound. So boom hopping, location recording, whatever you can find. And um, then I ended up going over to Australia and sort of as an ad hoc thing, did a course there um, at the Australian Film, Television and Radio School. And so that kind of filled in the gaps a bit because I think when you start out and you just sort of fall headlong into things, you, you end up with a few gaps in your knowledge. So that was really great to, to fill in a few extra things that I just jumped over somehow. And then um, started working in between Australia and New Zealand and uh to the uk and ended up for personal reasons not professional in los angeles thought i was only going to be here for a short time and i've been here for 13 years <laughs> love that yeah so i'm wondering um because Annalie, i know you did a lot of mixing and you kind of like you guys just sort of found your way into supervising so can we talk about that very first um supervising role that you all did what were the challenges that came with it and what were the things that were like very attractive about it? Like your very first official supervising credit. I think my very first official sound supervising credit was um, this movie called I'm Not a Hipster, which ended up um, winning Sundance. And what was really cool about that is everybody was very green who, from the actors to uh, the director, to the composer, to everybody involved. Um, and we were kind of figuring out together. And I didn't even realize what I was doing at the time was called sound supervising. I kept, I think my credit on there was sound designer, <laughs> even though we just did everything. And even the director now is like, so you're doing all the sound design? I was like, no, not, not really. I think my title is now this. He's like, oh, okay, well, can I just still call you a sound designer? <laughs> it's like, sure. And what I liked about sound supervising is 
if you do it right, you're on the project from the very beginning, sometimes even from early script phase before they start shooting and you can start de developing a palette for the film, what it's gonna sound like based off the script, what can we record? Um, and you start thinking about your team of people that you wanna work with that would be beneficial for the movie. And that's really fun because you can hopefully shape the sound character of the movie and hopefully the direction that you want. And that's fun. <laughs> awesome. Um, should I go? Okay. Um, so my, I'm going to skip over Mad About You and, and go to my first show, which actually on my podcast, I erroneously said it was The Net. And my very first um, hour drama was a show called Fame LA. Um, it was like fame, but set in LA. Um, and the thing that was challenging was a couple things. One, I was young, you know, I was like 27 year old, you know, young woman and the people in the department at Sony had known me as an assistant. And so I wasn't really getting the respect that you would get as a supervisor. And like some of the male um, editors gave me a hard time. Um, like if I wanted to fix, they would be, oh, well just do it yourself. And like, <laughs> oh my God. Um, so that was tricky. Another tricky thing was that as a sound supervisor, you're right in between two opposing forces. And what I mean by that is um, the client wants the best job they could possibly get all the creativity all the bells and whistles but your boss or the sound house wants you to keep the budget down and not to work any overtime and like so you're constantly having to do this dance right in the middle of of doing the best job you possibly can but also making the bean counters happy <laughs> so uh so that's challenging one fun thing about fame la um and I could be wrong, but I feel like a young Savion Glover was in it. You know, he's a famous tap dancer who kind of shadowed and came up under Gregory Hines. And he was in Fame LA and, um, and like Arnelie and I were talking about being dancers. I did ballet and I did tap and jazz. And when it came to do time to do the Foley for it, um, at first second, I thought, well, maybe I could like do the tapping, but then like looking at him in the scene, there's like no way. So basically he had to come in for ADR. Um, so I had this idea that, you know, can I grab him for 10 minutes, put him on the Foley stage with his tap shoes, you know, let's string up some headphones and, and that's what we did. And I knew that he'd get it on the first take because he's Savion Glover and he's also a tap dancer and if he hears the music he knows the dance so he's just gonna do it and there was like three scenes in the show and and you know it was like maybe a minute long each of them so it, there's room for error but he just nailed it on the first one and he left and I was like you know whoever mixes the M&E is gonna be so stoked <laughs> um, I don't know if you all know what M&E is but it stands for music and effects and basically the foreign markets need a fully filled m and &E that has everything but the dialogue so all the movement all the footsteps tap dancing um and you know the effects and so basically that's a kind of a separate thing that we do as supervisors is um oversee the m and &E, or at the very least prep so that there's no holes um, so hopefully that makes kind of some sort of sense to the newbies out there. But um, yeah, so that was some stories about my first experience. That's awesome. And Katie, you know it's your turn. What, tell us about your first supervising experience. Uh, my first supervising experiences were actually um, through film school. Um, so it was a whole pile of short films, just... Um, because prior to that, when I've been working, I was working as an assistant um, and so forth, not. So then, and then as a, um, as an effects or a dialogue editor, but I'm not really ever kind of, t you know, really just doing what I was told more than anything else. Like, okay, cut all the doors and all that kind of thing. So yeah, it was at film school where it was an opportunity to be creative and actually um, interact with the directors and filmmakers a lot more and, and see the process all the way through till the end to deal with 
all the delivery type options like Marla was just describing with the M and E track and all that and having to make all that sort of stuff. So it was uh, it was a really good experience, you know, on a small scale. So I could um, continually mess it up and uh, sort of cover my tracks. Oh, that's good. I um I love talking about messing up at the beginning of your career. Do you guys have any stories, specific incidents that you were just like banging your head on the wall because you were so green? I have so many stories. <laughs> this, I, I remember I did this. I did this short film and. I was just working off my laptop with my inbox or something, you know, and, and I was taking it over from somebody and they're like, oh, I didn't have time to cut the Bee Gees. And I go, right. And I get off the phone. I was like, what does that mean? And I Googled Bee Gees and nothing came up. And then finally had to talk to somebody else. And no, this backgrounds. I was like, what does that mean? Oh, like air and birds and winds. Oh, I have to cut that. Is that a thing? Like people do that. I was like, oh, man, this is a lot more work than thought it was going to be and so uh i i messed up real bad i um i didn't really know how to cut it or or i didn't know how to bounce stuff and so uh i learned a lot on that um one other time i really messed up is um i forget what movie it was but i was a mix tech at the time and this other sound supervisor who i won't say his name said hey do you want to you want to cut some backgrounds and at that time I knew what that meant I was like sure he's like uh why you you can cut backgrounds when you're doing your mix tech job you know in the back you can just work on it if you want to get in the sound editorial I was like okay well I've never really cut for a movie before um he's like I'll make your pro tools template I said oh great that would be that'd be awesome you know so I just want to see how things are laid out like how am I supposed to to get it because I don't want to look like a fool and I turn it over to these big wave film mixer guys and and then at the same time while I was working I was like why is he hiring me I was like oh I'm cheap and maybe he's uh that's then that turned out to be true but so I got this all this stuff it was six reels of a movie and I'm really dialing dialing in my backgrounds and it was in a you know, the two characters are working in sort of like a Costco. So there's lots of different kinds of sounds. And then the sound supervisor came in and he's like, you know, I was playing him some stuff. He's like, oh, this is really great. And gave me a couple of notes. I did it. And then I delivered it to his assistant, which then, then that sound supervisor told me, oh yeah, I watched it down. Everything's good. You're ready to go. Um, which I found out he didn't watch it down and he just delivered it to the mix stage. He made me a template that was cut in drop frame and I didn't know what that meant or even know how to look at that on my session. And so every single picture cut was out of sync from the very oh. And I was working with <laughs> these big mixers and I was so embarrassed. And then I get a call from the sound supervisor yelling at me and I'm like, you said you checked it. I don't even know what that means. And <laughs> you know, I'm green. And so then I had to go onto the mix stage I felt like a fool and I said hi I, I'm the one that cut all this stuff that's out of sync I'm gonna fix that and so I went into the back room and I fixed it all and let's just say I never made that mistake again and also when I'm supervising now I make it very clear to anybody who's on the team uh exactly what the parameters are for template people don't really cut and drop frame anymore it was sort of a thing in tv back then but yeah Wow. See, I love that. It's like music to my ears to hear. So, Cause this is on only blank guys, <laughs> like, <laughs> come on. Right. Like we all, there's hope for all of us. Marla, tell us. Well, I have something similar as far as a technical thing. Um, and it actually wasn't at the beginning of my career, which is makes it even worse. <laughs> uh, I was supervising the Foley on a film. I think this one was called Project X about this kid that has this party in Pasadena and it goes horribly wrong. Um, and I was pre-dubbing, we were pre-dubbing at the um, underground at Warner Brothers. They've got like all these stages, um, what we call it underground. And I was making like a master session that has every single reel um, like all in one big session. Um, 
just, just for expediency, but the mixer was mixing hour by hour by hour. And so like his session start time, like for out for real two would be hour two and hour three and that kind of stuff. And I remember he asked me some question about my start time and I thought I understood what he was saying. But clearly I did not because basically what he was doing, he had some, I'm used to mixers who, when you give them a fix or whatever, they, they import the tracks and then they copy the whole thing, grab the whole thing up, you know, keep the lock on so it doesn't move out of sync. And then, then they're off to the races and they delete the tracks at the bottom. But what he was doing is he was just importing the tracks and having them overlay he had something switched. I don't even, I mean, you guys could probably tell me what the, what those things, because, you know, when you import something, you can, there's little check boxes of what you can import. But basically, it all looked okay as far as, okay, so the stuff at hour three was coming in and now living there, but it blew away all of his automation before that. Yeah, so that was fun. Um, <laughs> because uh, I misunderstood how he was even doing it because I was busy cutting ahead of him. So I was figuring he was importing it, grabbing it, moving it up, and he was just replacing those tracks. And so that, um, yeah, it didn't go so well, but we, uh, <laughs> we had to like, or he had to work overtime because he was able to restore some of the automation from backups from the previous days. But there was a certain check, um, certain chunk that I don't know why, but he didn't have a backup and couldn't restore it. So he had to just like go screaming through it again. So yeah, so don't don't do that. Maybe Anneli or Katie, you can tell me what setting that is. <laughs> the setting that says do not touch. <laughs> Katie. What do you have? What are your green green errors, <laughs> tales from the olden days? Tales of woe. Um, yeah, tales of woe. I definitely deleted stuff I shouldn't have. Did that, you know, when people uh, were supposed to have backed up and didn't, you know, and you're there, you're an assistant, you're supposed to sort of keep an eye on that. So that was always painful. Oops. And then, um, you know, uh, let's see. Oh God all that kind of stuff or when satellite first coming in and on mix stages and stuff and hitting the buttons and constantly throwing the mix off, um, you know, um, oh yeah, lots of, lots of little things you just keep doing until you remember not to ever do them again, I suppose. Um, yeah. And uh, yeah, definitely um, having the frame rate set incorrectly and having to redo a session. I had a similar one to Annalise where it was suddenly all off and that stuff because in, in uh, New Zealand and Australia and stuff, you know, there's films at 24 and TVs at 25. So you can get into all kinds of fun and games that way and you go the wrong direction and all of a sudden, yeah, you got problems. So pl plenty of things to, to learn from. <laughs> Yes, thank you for sharing that, guys. It's very helpful. I, I like those stories. Um, I suppose we should cover uh, the essence of what sound supervising actually is. Like, what does your day to day look like? What are you guys overseeing? Um, and is it because I know you mentioned uh, maybe Anneli mentioned this uh, pre production to get involved in the pre production stages? Is that really common? Uh, do you guys find so? Yeah, go nuts. What 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 is this job for you? Marla, what's that you want me to go yeah oh sure um well i'll just say that um i mostly do tv and streaming these days and so i we don't really get involved that early in the pre-production um sometimes um i'll be lucky enough to be able to kind of work with production like on that show your honor um because of covid they had a break and they didn't shoot for like five months, um, but I was already getting his stuff and I emailed him saying, hey, that's great. Keep it up with the two two booms, you know, and and uh, and he called me and we kind of started this working relationship and he like recorded the main characters motorcycle for me and like sent it to me and and 
and we just really were in touch and like there was something that needed to be played back on the stage, um, a 911 call. And um, so I got the stems and I sent it to them. So so that was really, really cool. But as far as pre-production, I, I, like I said, in TV, I don't really get involved with pre-production. -pre but as a supervisor, generally the workflow is you go to a spotting session, although now um, every, everything's remote. So you do this and you pin the picture with some one of these platforms. Um, and at the spotting session, it's usually the post producer, the picture editor, uh, maybe the picture assistant, uh, production coordinator, supervisor. And you just go through the show and they tell you uh, what they want for the show, uh, where the ADR lines are. Uh, and sometimes if you're lucky, um, they actually let you kind of come to the party with your own creativity. Um, it really, really varies because sometimes like on the Shonda Rhimes shows, like she signed off on things and she's super busy. So it is what it is. And I'm not really going to be able to do much other than be a traffic cop. <laughs> um, but on your honor, they really wanted my input as far as the storytelling and stuff. Um, but so, so you do the spotting session and then you cue all the ADR, the group ADR and the principal ADR. Um, you cue all the foley, which is we were talking about, which is the, the footsteps and touches, pats. Um, you create uh, notes for your sound editors, so dialogue notes, like where you might want an alt or anything that's not obvious or that you want to make sure they don't miss, like something that they need to grab from the OMF. And the OMF is come, well, now they're AAFs, but a lot of people still call them OMFs, but that comes directly from the picture department. That's what they have in their avid. Um, so you can find a lot of good tidbits in there as far as even if they forget to tell you something, you can get a clue as to what they want by looking at what's in their uh, AAFs and also listening to the guide track. Um, and then you shoot the ADR. And in the old days, you would physically go to an ADR stage and be in the same room with the actor. And like I was saying before, you have to be able to elicit a performance out of the actor, but you can't come across like you're the director at all um, because they will not react kindly to that. And you're not the director, you're the sound supervisor. But at the same time, generally speaking, actors hate ADR and, you know, because they're in this sterile environment, they're not working off of another actor. Um, so a lot of times their energy is low, their pitch is off, the performance isn't great. And so I'll try to use adjectives that get them there without sounding like I'm directing. Um, you know, like I might compliment them, like, okay, that was great. Um, how about, can we do another one and add something? So I always try to speak in a positive light as opposed to a negative, you know? So instead of saying, um, that was horrible. <laughs> Uh, I'll say that was great. Let's let's add something or I'll say, you know what I really liked about production? You know, you kind of had a twinkle in your eye and I could kind of hear that in your performance. So that'd be awesome if we can like, you know, add that back in. Um, so all these little tricks, um, you really have to kind of get their personality and see what makes them tick and see what will work the best for them. Um, and then I usually cut all my ADR just because I know the reason why we're shooting it and I try to cross between syllables and do all this fancy stuff and use a program called Revoice Pro where I can actually change the performance of the ADR if I don't get it exactly right by you know, changing the inflection. Um, and then uh, your editors are usually great and so they just send their stuff to the dub stage and then I show up on the dub stage or um, on my computer these days. But I, even during the pandemic, I would physically go to Paramount at least for the last day, just because I wanted to hear it on the big stage and not just on my headphones, not just the LTRT. So, um, so oversee the mix and then the client comes in after some time where we're just by ourselves, you know, getting everything into shape. And we do a ton of playbacks for the post producer, the picture editor, and then ultimately the showrunner. Uh, and then they give their notes and we address their notes. And then that's pretty much just it.
That's perfect. That's a really, that's a good um, overview. So thanks for that. Um, Annalise, did you want to speak to the question in the chat about? Um... Oh yeah, I res I'm responding. Oh, you did. Yeah, I see. Um, oh, perfect. Yeah, Jilly uh, asks whether sound supervisors or freelancer work for Post House. They're both, it all depends. Some people work for a specific place like Formosa or Sony or Warner Brothers and then other people are freelance. It just depends on the vibe of the person and most sound supervisors are in a 60 hour work week. Um, I know some places are less, it all depends on their contract that they have with the union. Um, and I also said, I don't know, some people might not know what LTRT means. Uh, LTRT is your Dolby encoded stereo file that you listen that is derived from your 5.1 or 7.1 or Dolby Atmos. <laughs> Um, yeah, sound supervising is a little different for me. It definitely is a different for when you're doing TV than because you have normally less time and, and um, if you're on a film where you're fortunate, where you have more time, uh, it's great. Um, sound supervising for me is it's a lot of phone calls. It's a lot of spreadsheets. Um, sometimes you're like, just stop calling me for questions. Um, so normally, um, cause I do a lot of cutting. I do a lot of sound design when I supervise. So a lot of times I'll do that stuff at night or I'll even work on a Sunday. And because I know that my email won't ring or phone beep or vice versa. Um, get together with your team, give them tasks. I like to have, you know, weekly Zoom or phone call with the editors that are cutting different food groups for your film, which means someone could just be cutting the backgrounds, the winds and the birds. Someone could just be cutting the horses. Someone could just be cutting the cars. Someone could just be cutting all the effects. Someone could just be only focusing on queuing ADR. Someone could just be working on production dialogue. And so it's good to get kind of your whole team talking. Um, I really do believe that creating a safe space for your editors to try stuff and not feel scared to get weird or think outside the box creates for a better soundtrack because they might try something that they wouldn't have normally thought of. And so, um, if you have the time, it's cool to give them space to, especially on the effects side, to say, okay, that's great. Now um, do the scene again, but try to do it completely differently. And they go, some people get excited about that note and some people go, uh. <laughs> but what's cool about that is it kind of gets people's brains working in a different way. And then what I like to do is I, uh, get all their tracks, especially on the sound effects side, and I mix them. I make uh, mixes to the picture editor department. And so it's really great if you can get stuff early to the picture editors or have a director hear stuff. Um, so they start falling in love with the sound that you are creating versus their sound ideas, 101 door clothes that they put in there. So that is a goal that I strive. And even if, you know, I, every week I'm like, every Friday, I just send them a whole bunch of stuff. And, and sometimes I'll even make bounces and put it up on picks for then the director or picture editors to watch if they don't have time to actually bring it into their timeline. So that's my huge goal for that. And another huge goal of mine is to find the best Foley ever, because I love playing Foley. Uh, very prominent. I know some people are like, yeah, Foley and group. And I'm like, yeah, we got to hear all of that. We got to hear all that. That's uh, also why I like working with Katie. She loves loop group. And so uh, sometimes I'm like, what am I going to do with all this stuff? Look at all these tracks. But then you go, oh, and you find a place for it. And it really makes the scene come alive, like certain little nuances of things that I wouldn't think to do. That's why it's fun to have a whole team of people working with you to create something uh, 
because it's all about collaboration. That's all. Katie. Oh, sorry. Okay. Katie. <laughs> Do you have anything to say about your um, uh, findings on what it's like to be a supervising sound editor? What, what you cover, what these guys missed? Um, I don't know. I think um, Marla and Annalie covered it fairly well, actually. I don't know if I have any more to add to that. I'm not uh, <laughs> leaving it all to them, but yeah, I think... Um, I think fostering a sort of team environment where, yeah, like Connolly says, people can try things out as well as keep, I like keeping people on the team, even like during this, these times where we're not physically in the same space, um, like we would perhaps be normally. Um, it's nice to keep everybody in touch with each other and um, kind of feel part of a team because it is a soundtrack and it's comprised of many, many elements. So, you know, making, whether it's the uh, Foley editor aware of some of the stuff that effects are doing or um, dialogue, knowing what um, the Foley is doing, you know, just everybody kind of being part of it is a really important aspect, I think. And, um, you know, people, we're, we're, um, we're social creatures, whether we're extroverts or introverts. So I think um, people like having the contact with other people and not just being on an island. And you can get uh, good results out of people that way if they feel like they're part of something. So how do you um, work to foster that? Um, is it similar to Annalise to get people to keep, you know, giving input and stuff? Like, how do you keep people on track with this new, I guess there's a total new workflow um, now that we're doing this pandemic thing, right? It's just checking in, right? Yeah. yeah. You know, being like, hey, how's it going? Maybe give people little deadlines, like, hey, can you send me what you've done for this scene? Can you send it to me on Friday? And they go, ooh, what about Monday? You go, okay. And so, and sometimes depending on who your editor is, you tell them Friday knowing that you're gonna get it in two weeks. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it's been weird doing the whole Zoom team stuff, you know, it's different, but some. I know a lot of people love working at home, so they can create their own hours and it's less driving and all that stuff. I think on the mix stage, it makes it a little bit more challenging because you don't have the camaraderie and just the normal chit chat that you normally would. Because a lot of that chit chat goes, oh, let's just raise that drum there. What do you think about this? And you can just sort of talk out loud sort of while you're trying stuff. So that, that I feel I'm looking forward to getting back where people are in the room on the mix stage because I think that is super helpful. Yeah, and just to jump in what Arnley just said, um, part of that chit chat is also rapport building and relationship building. And mm -hmm. if you're physically on the stage, you can really take the temperature of the room. Like sometimes you can feel it, you know, like if something's not going so well, you can just feel it and you can maybe do something to cut the tension or make a little joke or, you know, um, whereas if everybody is remote and in their own little spaces on Zoom, um, you, you don't have access to that as much. And diplomacy is something about being a supervisor that is a really great skill to develop, knowing what to say, what not to say, um, you know, knowing kind of the hierarchy like of the people in the room um and a lot of that is just harder to navigate like i said remotely um because if you're on the stage then you really feel like you're getting to know your clients and they're getting to know you and they're getting to trust you and again there's something different about physically being there that's helpful that we're having to contend with now I'm reading some questions here in the comment box where it says, um, uh, uh, Ian Fry says, does anyone work with music production like background music? I'm interested in placements as well. Any advice as a songwriter? Um, if you wanna write songs or do underscore, then do it. Just the best way to is 
to try to hook up with a young filmmaker or do short films, do stuff for free as much as you can because you never know when your indie filmmaker that didn't have any money goes and makes something that actually does. And if you create and try out and make errors and figure out your sound, how you're gonna record it, um, how are you going to deliver it to the mix stage? That's helpful. If you just want to try to make some music tracks to then try, it's hard to give stuff to a music supervisor, but that is a way to hook up with some band managers. Um, uh, like Laurel Stern's amazing. She helps a lot of people out, um, different people as well to try to get your music known by some people that might not have heard your music before. That's what I would say about that. That's good. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, we, I know there are a lot of things coming in the chat. So we really, um, that's, thanks guys for. There's another one here, Patricia says, what sound editor opportunities will be available in cities outside of LA, New York, and Atlanta? And I'm like, well, where do you live? Um, it depends if you want to go into post-production sound or if you want to go into live sound or what your goal is. You know, live sound, you can do anywhere. Post-production, you can do more and more other places because you can work at home. But in order to do that, you need to get a rapport with a sound supervisor or someone ahead of time to give you, so they have that trust that no matter where you go, you'll be able to deliver. Um, LA, New York, what else is there? London, New Zealand, they have. Australia, they have. Any other choices of? There's also, there's the whole sort of commercial world and stuff as well, which I know used to be really big in Chicago, was it? It was a really yeah. big um, commercial world and lots of places, you know, there's always regional television in, in uh, places, whether it's, so then there's opportunities there for production sound or potentially post-production sound, you know. Mix, live mixing the weather channel, you know, you know, kind of type things, you know, there's, there's, there's the opportunities maybe less and, and so forth, but there, there's always somebody doing some kind of video production work somewhere. Um, and, you know, maybe that's, that's a good avenue to try for, you know, just finding the smaller places. Yeah, and I would just say that um, that's great advice just to get your feet wet, wet and, and learn technology and things. I mean, that's kind of what I did in San Diego, worked for that TV station. Uh, but if you want to do the level that we're talking about and the depth that we're talking about, uh, as far as post-production sound, my feeling is that you really should move to LA or London or New York at least to start with and build your relationships, build your craft and your chops. And then, you know, once you're established, then you can move wherever because now we've all figured out how to work remotely. Um, I just think it would be pretty hard to get in and move your way up at this level um, if you're not one of these bigger markets, but certainly there's plenty of things to do in the smaller markets to start with. Yeah. Um, someone was asking about, um, like, do you have to have an overview of all the areas of post-production and know them like the back of your hand as a sound supervisor, or is it okay to like know one area, like I'm a really good dialogue editor and then become a supervisor? Is there like a typical level you have to hit to be a successful supervisor? I think you do need a working knowledge of everything. I mean, you can specialize in something. What do you reckon, Ollie? You were going to say something? I mean, you definitely need to have the knowledge of the process of how to get to the beginning and end and stay on budget. Um, sometimes it's very hard to stay on budget. You don't want to be the overtime queen like me. Um, but so, and also don't jump into sound supervising too soon. It's okay, be an editor for a while or be a mixed tech or be an assistant, figure out what you really want to do because you might not like sound supervising. You actually might want to just be a sound designer and be in your cubby and create cool sounds and not have to worry about the day to day budget. How many hours did you work on this week? And what's the blah, blah, blah. That can get very 
annoying sometimes about that side of the job. <laughs> yeah, having, I think I totally agree. Oops, sorry, what? You now having the full range of how to do it. Yeah, and I, and I think as well, the other side of it is um, it's not, people don't come in and just suddenly be sound supervisors. You know, you have to build up to that. And a lot of that is the rapport with the team of people you're working with. You know, they ultimately, they have to respect you. So to some extent, you have to earn that. Mm -hmm. So, so how, how does one? earn that like interpersonally how do you command command yourself as a leader earn people's trust the trust of the clients how do you go about navigating that Carry on small jobs don't, yeah. start, don't start with the big kahuna i don't think anybody's going to give you the big kahuna when you start you know just take whatever you can get do stuff for free i'm such an advocate of that because when you're learning then if it's free if you make a mistake then you're like well this is what we do, you know, and, and it's okay. Like, don't be scared of making a mistake. It happens to all of us, you know? Yeah. And one good thing about these days is that it's somewhat affordable just to get your own rig. You know, like when I started the cyber frame, the machine was like a hundred thousand dollars. So it's like, you know, nobody's going to get that in their house and be practicing. So you had to get in another way. Um, but now you can buy pro tools and a laptop and you can work on YouTube videos or like I used to go over to AFI and volunteer to do the sound on their films or you know you can go join a meetup or sound girls and all these things. Um, the other thing I want to mention on this topic is that I found that being an assistant actually had more things in common with supervisor supervising than being an editor. So like when I was at Sony and then a new boss came in um, I, you know, I tried my hardest, you know, to work really hard and be really good at what I, what I did. And it was all technical at that point. Um, and he noticed that I was organized and seemed to have a good rapport with the other assistants. So he immediately promoted me to the head of the assistants. And then I actually went to him. And again, I was like 26 or something. And, and I said, listen, this is way too early. I totally get it. But I just want you to know that down the line, I would love to be a sound supervisor. Again, I know I'm too young, I know it's too early, but I just want to kind of plant that seed that that's what I want, you know, um, in the long run. And it was great that I did that because that's really how I got the opportunity. I mean, I did have to do the other steps in between um, editing, but um, but not that long. Uh, but, it, but again, like uh, Katie, to answer your question, you can hone some of these skills in a role that's down the chain a little bit, you know, like communication skills and organization skills and um, playing well with others and um, things like that. Thanks for that. That's really good. Um, can we go get into some tales, some stories about spotting sessions on the mix stage back when stuff was in person? What are some of your some highlights that kind of make you, because I know I've heard the mix stage has some funny moments, funny little moments. <laughs> Do you know, anything come to mind? Um, funny, it all depends on the show that you're on. Um, like Barry Jen Jenkins, we don't really do spotting session. Uh, every once in a while we will. Uh, but he's just like, all right, you go to town boss lady and you just let me know when I can hear something. And he, I go, oh, okay. Um, well, then other people really wanna, you know, the creators of Game of Thrones, you sit for hours talking about the spotting session and with the sound supervisor. And then when they come into the mix stage, um, our sound supervisor would be like, well, that was a spotting note. We're like, yeah, yeah, we are, we're gonna take that out. We don't like it, you know? And he's like, oh, you know, and, and a lot of times mixers, uh, we can be hard headed sometimes. And it's fun to try stuff, even if the sound supervisor is telling you no. Um, and hopefully they'll respect your decision, even though, you know, you can put it back to how it was, but it's, 
um, a process, you know, um, spotting sessions, I feel get you part, part of the way there, what they want, but sometimes directors or picture editors don't necessarily know how to completely vocalize how everything should be. But definitely having spotting sessions and going through ADR is super important. I can't really think of any funny stories on the mixed stage as far as spotting sessions go, except for when you don't do a spotting session and they come into mixed stage and have all these new ideas and you're like, this is gonna take me forever. Now the, the lion is not a lion, it's a truck, you know, or something. <laughs> Oh, it's, it's not a funny place then, eh? This is this is serious business. Serious <laughs> business. I, I, I'm re sorry, I didn't mean to get quiet. I'm reading some of these people. Yeah. Um, Although the stage yeah. can be a funny place. If, if you're working with the same people and you've been doing a show for seven years or whatever, then you might be in a position to do jokes, um, which, which is great. Um, so... And the loop group is always game for jokes. And sometimes they'll just do a joke automatically. And if it's clients that I know and that'll think it's funny, um, you know, I'll, I'll put it in and I'll make an, well, I used to make a note when there were physical cue sheets, but now I'll make it in the Pro Tools saying, play this loud, <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, and then it's just a matter of, do you keep the joke in for playback or like who has the sense of humor and who doesn't? It? It doesn't so sometimes it's just for us and sometimes you'll actually keep it in for the showrunner but really again have to know your audience yes it could be a fine line like, do we take the joke out oh shit I'm like <laughs> yeah or, or god forbid you leave it in and it gets to air <laughs> yeah don't do that that's a bad idea i'm trying to understand what jonah's question is here he always wanted to be a music editor, but figured maybe he could speak on this question because I don't understand what you're exactly asking. Uh, what's another question here? If you have any tips and methods or apps of software for breaking down the signal task, getting and staying organized and maintaining on schedule, love to hear about workflow. Tips and met, I mean, uh, we all use Pro Tools and now there's a lot of different other kind of software uh, like Auto Align Post, you know, they use that for uh, dialogue recording. So you can have your boom track and your ISO now. Hopefully your dialogue editor will cut both of them, even if um, one, the boom is not necessarily usable. and. It does make the track sound better now with this new this new software if it's used correctly. Um, yeah. And also for ADR, have them do the same thing with the the boom and the loft for ADR. Um, yeah. I would just say one thing that I I do is actually just on my Mac and it's pretty simple, but it's worked really well, and that is that program stickies. You know, where like and you can have different color stickies. Um, so I have an ongoing to-do list, just like everything on that list, like every single day, and then I save it year by year. Um, and then a lot of times I end up doing more than one show. So like I was doing Scandal and The Catch and How to Get With Murder all at the same time. So one show would be one color, one show would be a different color, and the third show would be a third color. And then I would have a different sticky per episode and then also in my email I have you know folders under each show and each episode because sometimes what happens is let's say the production mixer or even somebody from an editor has a question or a thought or wants a sound effect to put in their avid um, or something about an episode you haven't even seen yet um, and I'd love getting that information but I'll like put that email let's say in the its correct folder and then Maybe I'll add that to the sticky note for episode 107, colored blue, because that's the color of that show. And then when I finally get there, oh, I look at that sticky note and everything kind of makes sense. Mm -hmm. So that's just something that probably everybody has that is one way that I stay organized. Calendar, keep your calendar always up to date. Katie, do you use any like Google spreadsheets or anything like that? 
Yeah, I do. I do use that, especially when it comes to um, different versions when we're dealing with um, films where we're dealing with multiple um, turnovers of every reel and all that kind of thing, trying to keep track of at what stage it's at, which editor is on which reel, um, you know, because sometimes you might divide, depending on um, the type of film and the type of skills your effects editors have, you might just assign them a couple of reels of the film, you know, because the film's generally divided anywhere between five to 10 reels, something like that. So you might assign them a whole reel and say, just do all the effects on that, um, on this reel, this reel, this reel, or you might, um, if they have a particular skill for combat or something like that, maybe they just go through and do all the combat. So then you'd not, it's good to keep track of where they're at. So that's all part of the checking and things. So Google Docs can be quite useful for that because then they can just fill it in. Everybody has a sharing ability with that. Slack is quite good too for keeping up communication. You can have many groups within there of people and yeah, <clears throat> calendar up to date, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. I'm a new Slack user, kind of into it. It's cool, man. Cool, man, it's like a new chat. Okay, so, okay, Jonah's question here. Um, a lot of times women have a knack for being amazing assistants, but also it gets to the point where we're valued so much as an assistant, it's hard to move up the ladder. Uh huh. Yeah, so this, this definitely happens if you're at a company, it doesn't matter if you're male or female, but a lot of times you have to leave where you are and take a job somewhere else. And then, if, and then eventually go back to where you came so people can look at you in a new light. You know, um, if you were the coffee girl and, and all of a sudden you're, you're doing more stuff, certain people will always be like, think of you as the coffee girl. And that happens, that happened to me big time. Uh, I taught you there, you know, when I was getting into mixing, there was no, no women, there was, and, you know, a few, a handful. And, and I remember sitting in the mix chair and when I was walking in, the guy's like, Hey, can you make me a latte? I was like, sure. Made him a latte. And, and he was the client on my stage. I gave him a latte and he's like, Oh, you're my mixer. I was like, yeah. He's like, Oh, and so it's an, it's just, you go, you embrace it and go, okay, it's just how it is. Uh, just gotta be better than the boys. <laughs> yeah, that's good advice. Marley, I think you said something similar about there's um, something good about moving around, uh, s stability I, in that way. Yeah, well, a couple of things. One, I, I think that you have more job stability bouncing around than you do just being at one place for your whole career because anything can happen at any time. Um, like Tadeo went under and all those people, uh, you know, had to find new places. Um, yeah, so I, I, I just think the more people you know, um, the better, you know, as far as networking. Um, and, and yeah, to Annalie's point, um, that's kind of what happened for me at Sony, like I mentioned before, you know, they knew me as an assistant and all of a sudden I was supervising, I was getting all this pushback, but now when I go back to Sony, um, you know, it's kind of a different ball game. Or when I left Sony and went other places, they hadn't seen me be an assistant, they just knew there was a supervisor coming in. So I kind of had, you know, respect right off the bat. I think it also helps to um, not get stuck in your own ways. Like if you have the opportunity to work in different countries, different facilities or anything, you get to see people working in a different way you would never have thought of. And that can, you know, whether it's creatively, how they might approach a sound design moment or whether it's just physically, because they're like, no, man, I use this program. It's really cool. And you're like, oh, damn. You know, um, there's a lot of, you know, the sound post-production has become a lot more homogenous. When I started out, it was, there were a lot of different options. Some fortunately went away because they were kind of great big hulking dinosaurs of digital audio workstations. But, you know, there used to be Fairlights and, you know, AMS audio file, and you had to know how to use them all. There wasn't just, it wasn't just Digi Design and Pro Tools. Now it's sort of a bit of a one-track pony there, but, um, 
yeah, I think it's very beneficial to see how other people work. And it, it, I think it also can make you a lot more patient with the process because things go wrong and dealing with different environments and so forth um, uh, give you the ability to see things from somebody else's perspective and how they, how they work. So it just makes it a bit easier down the track. You don't get so frustrated. Yeah, well said, that, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, I was wondering, are there some moments in a show you've all worked on where you were like pulling your hair out because it was so much work and it's just one moment, one tiny moment that you know viewers may not know how much work you put into it. Anything okay. that you recall? Like every scene. All of them. <laughs> every scene, yeah. You know, um, what's interesting, uh, Katie and I did this movie called Just Mercy um, a few years back and which is fabulous, but that show was really hard because it was so quiet. And when we first started working on it, you know, recorded all these prison sounds at Rikers Island, got all these recordings on death row, which really is crazy sounding. We built this huge track, we recorded all this group and what was interesting, you know, at first the director wanted that and after he was listening to some stuff that we were doing, he liked it, but then he says, you know, I think the movie is about these two characters forming, forming a bond between a wall on death row. It's not really about the realism of how loud death row actually is. And when he made that comment, it really stuck with us. And so we sadly muted everything that we had done and we started over from scratch. And, and then it got to the point where it was like, what's that sound? We're like, oh, that's your production error. Yeah, can we take that out? And so it became the quietest track and made it very hard to mix dialogue and to make it sound quiet without over no noising. Um, there might be a couple of lines that are that I over no noised in that movie, but um, it was really that was a really hard movie, and people probably wouldn't necessarily think that just by watching it. And how do you make a courtroom scene? There's a lot of these courtroom scenes <laughs> when we first were playing down the courtroom scene. It was like an influenza ward. <laughs> Everybody was. <laughs> coughing and we we're trying to fill a space and I was like oh this is terrible it's just <laughs> what are we doing here so we like muted all of it and just try to create a realistic courtroom sound and, and I think it worked because Katie and I did get a lot of comments on how real the courtroom sound we're like oh yes <laughs> good it wasn't just like chair <laughs> cook creaks you know it's like what else what else would you hear in that scene so Sometimes quieter movies are harder than the big loud ones. You have nothing to hide behind. Yeah, that's that's really interesting. That's something I feel like I'm getting a sense of. But yeah, it wouldn't not, it wouldn't necessarily be the intuitive expectation that a quieter movie is actually a really hard sound movie to tackle. Yeah. And yeah, um, every I, little sound matters. You know. Right. Yeah. Oh, shit. Definitely. Yeah. Katie, fond memories of Just Mercy? <laughs> uh, yeah, the, the emphysema ward. Uh, <laughs> we put up all the courtroom tracks. was quite classic. But um, yeah, <laughs> um, yeah no, that, it was a very interesting sort of thing because, yeah, we, we approach it like, oh, yeah, we, this is how we're going to make it real. And then with our director, Destin, just sort of pointing out that that's what this, that will distract, you know, from what's really going on and what the film's about. So that's always an important lesson to, to be reminded of, you know, that uh, it's not all about your job. <laughs> it is about the words that they're saying, you know, story. Mm -hmm. and, and I would just say, for me, sometimes the most challenging scenes um, are ones involving ADR. Um, and it, it depends on why they're, looping something too, because uh, a lot of times they just want to add a line because they 
let's say cut out a scene and that I need to add back that, that information and it's on an over the shoulder shot, but they've like shoehorned it in. They haven't really given enough time for it to sound natural. Um, or, and so that's a challenge or uh, they wanna change performance. Like that is really, really, really hard. And I always tell the producers, okay, we can try it, but a couple things. One, you kind of have a finite amount of goodwill with the actor. Um, and, and you don't want to kind of waste it on something that you're going to have to throw out anyway. So I try to like talk to them about how realistic it is that this is even going to work. Um, but if they still insist on it, then it's a matter of degree. Because if it's on somebody's face, then it's going to, the sink is going to look weird, even if it's dead on because they're changing the performance and that's not what their face did. Um, so I tend to make a career out of scenes like that <laughs> on my own time, um, where I cut syllables from dialogue alts and the ADR alts, and I use Revoice Pro to change the inflection. Or sometimes one trick that I, I landed on that I was pretty excited about was I'd never, it, it had never occurred to me that I could manipulate the production sound, meaning, you know, I was used to changing the, the timing and the pitch of an ADR line, but the lines around it, I kind of thought were sacrosanct. And then I, there was this one ADR line where uh, this guy's pitch was so much lower than production that I ended up um, raising the pitch of the ADR, but lowering the pitch of the production around it. Um, which like in that moment when it worked, I was like, Eureka, <laughs> you know, like, like I said, I, so there's always things that, you think is you think there are rules about things and there are but you know rules are made to be broken so you know it, i also found out by trial and error how to really mix and match the boom and the body mic not only on the adr but also on the surrounding lines so like i might do a huge crossfade on something to kind of lead the sound over to the better mic and then lead it kind of out with a long fade. Um, so, so I'm not talking about a specific example, just, just in general, I find that ADR, you know, because you also want to preserve the actor's performance and their intention. And they come in, they do their ADR and they, they leave. And if it's a big famous person and they don't have a lot of time, they can walk off the stage and you're like, that, is not going to work, and then, and then, you know, that's I was telling you, Katie, before Magic Marla, uh, that's where I roll up my sleeves and just throw some hail marys. <laughs> it's so funny that like all this work that goes behind, I guess, all of it, like that, you know, can be missed by viewers that because it just comes together so well, and we're like. Yeah, isn't that how it was recorded the whole time? <laughs> like all of this, the worlds that we're creating. Yeah, that's amazing. Um, there was a really good question in the chat and I was wondering the same thing about um, kind of maintaining work-life balance. <laughs> uh, how to stay, you know, a person so that you can supervise. <laughs> how do you handle that? Hmm. I don't know. I'm still trying to figure that one out myself. So yeah, lot, and, yeah, everybody's got a different path on that one. Yeah, it all depends. Uh, I'm a workaholic. It's, uh, it's a problem. Um, so I, I work a ton. I am, I'm getting better at after a job taking time off, but everybody's different. You have to figure out what your work-life balance needs to be for yourself, you know, and try to set the, set those boundaries and stay by them. That's hard it is. Yeah, and I think the other thing that helps is like, you know there's gonna be a crunch time because there always is. Where that happens, it can happen in bursts if you're on a film and you have temp mixes, you know, where you do like a temporary sort of thing for a screen, a preview screening or something. So everybody's, you know, kind of crashes in together and does this mix for a few crazy days you know so you might have a few of those on a feature um and then of course you've got the end but i think you know it's coming you know it's going to happen so you just do whatever you whatever's going to make your own life 
more kind of not into or have the work not interfere as much or you know what do you do do you pre-make 10 dinners do you whatever you know whatever works for you to kind of get there um but anticipating that that it's gonna it's gonna be hard is probably part of the uh part of the game yeah and i would just say part of the reason why it's hard and part of the reason why there's so many hours um is because it's so subjective and we're not making widgets. I mean, there's not like a clear, you can go, oh, okay, this is done, you know, especially as an editor or supervisor. Um, so you wanna make it as good as it can possibly be and that just takes hours. So for me, I work hard and I play, play hard. Um, you know, so when I do have some time off, I travel or go to New Zealand and jump off the sky tower in Auckland. <laughs> Oh, man. or the canyon swing jump. Um, so yeah, so I, I don't know. I, if you're, it's super hard when you're working, I think, to find that balance. But when you're not working, um, that's when you can get your massages and travel and see people you haven't seen in a long time. Is that strange to kind of come off of a a, like a really intense work period and then you're suddenly back in like the real world a different flow of things yeah I don't like it I'm like looking for a job already <laughs> yeah <laughs> something I'm working through though <laughs> uh, yeah I find it's harder to go back for me it's easier to finish something and then have some time off and do all these things that I love than it is to start back up especially if starting back up is zero to 60, you know, in like five minutes. It's like, oh, right, okay. I had to like get back into that mentality of go, 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 go. And my, my post-it list of every hour is mapped out. <laughs> Katie, there's a question in the chat for you. Can we talk a little Lord of the Rings? It's, um, oh, sorry. I know I'm so bad at reading <laughs> on camera. This is a question from Mandy Piketty as a Lord of the Rings fan through and through. What are some of the best memories working on sound for those iconic movies? And has the process of editing Andy Serkis' original Gollum voice and all the sound he makes changed over the years? Um, well, I'll answer the last question first. Uh, I didn't work on the dialogue on Rings. I was on the effects side, effects and folding. So, as far as editing his dialogue goes and what he was doing, I don't think anything would have changed there as well as um, his performance. Uh, I mean, yeah, what it, it's his performance that's in there. So nothing has um, changed there. Um, good memories. Well, there's a lot of them because I, um, I worked on those films for three and a half, over a period of three and a half years. Uh, so, yeah, we did, we did a lot of uh, dodgy things because in New Zealand, uh, well, not dodgy, but you know, in America, the, the standards about when you go to go out recording and so forth, you know, you have to have safety people and all this sort of thing. And it's like, yeah, we didn't do quite as much of that. So um, we did some fairly dangerous kind of recordings, throwing, ca throwing cars off cliffs and things like that to get sound effects. That was quite fun. And I got hit by a car flying past. <laughs> I spent a lot of time in zoos um, all over the country and in Australia uh, recording animals, getting to know the keepers, getting to be in the back parts of zoos and all that sort of stuff. It was, that was super fun. I think probably those kinds of aspects, which you only get the, you really, it's only on big movies where there's a budget for location, sort of, well, for sound effects recording. And we didn't have a very big budget at all for it. And most of it was done on favors and stuff or, you know, just showing up the six pack of beer gets you quite a bit of currency. But um, like getting to learn something about another, uh, like, yeah, like a keeper's job, what do they do? Oh, you spend a lot of day picking up poo. Oh, interesting. How do you go about that? And then you get to know what they do and having that exposure to some other aspects of life that you would not be aware of is, is uh, kind of pretty cool or, you know, sitting down and talking to somebody who makes quills, you know, 
and they then they get very excited when you start to sort of somebody's actually interested and they're like oh well this makes a different sound on this type of paper really oh show me you know and you get to learn you get to somebody else gets to tell you about what they do and you get to learn about it so those kinds of things were probably the coolest but yes i could witter on about sort of silly stories but i think uh, <laughs> That's more anecdotal. I don't know how much uh, education there is in that. Uh, that's awesome. What advice do you have for um, for uh, learning a new DAW? Uh, do you know about good resources to for people looking to you know learn about Pro Tools and all that? So, so Allison wants to record using her microphone into Pro Tools. Um, I mean, it's pretty easy now. You just have to get some sort of preamp. There's, a, there's some pretty inexpensive ones. There's Focusrite. Um, there's even smaller ones. You can get a Guitar Center that or USB that you can plug right into your laptop uh, that have, you can get a microphone that has an XLR cable or you can get a less expensive microphone that can also be USB. Um, and you could start practicing that. You just have to make an audio track, find your input in your IO, select it, input one. It's very easy, mic. And, and it should be very simple. And there's YouTube videos on how to uh, record just a single mic like that. Um, that would be the way to start learning how to do it before you do some crazy big setup with outboard gear and all kinds of stuff. Yeah, and there's there's books out there too, um, but, but it's nice yep. to just sit down and just read a book about Pro Tools or dialogue editing cover to cover um, or sound editing in general, just to kind of let stuff wash over you, not that you have to memorize it, but if, I find that if I do that first and then I take an online class or YouTube videos, um, you know, there's like lynda.com and there's ask video or there's different subscription uh, platforms that get pretty deep into everything, including like RX, which is a noise reduction program that can do a lot of cool stuff. Um, so at this point, there's a lot of resources online. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, shout out to the Sound Girls videos. Definitely really good videos uh, on the Sound Girls YouTube. Uh, have you ever supervised a project starting from the script? Yes. Is that better? Well, I mean, that's, that's the pre-production kind of stuff. Right, yeah. yeah. Great, read a script find your library, figure out where you're going to record. Super fun. <laughs> yeah, and when I read a script, um, I have this uh, habit, I, I get a yellow Sharpie and anything having to do with sound at all, I'll just highlight it in the script. Um, I might not even go back to it ever, but it's just like a fun little exercise, like, um, or make notes in the margin mm -hmm. about the character, anything that I think I can use to tell the story with sound, ultimately. Like I said, it may not even end up in the show, but um, just to start with, it's kind of a fun exercise. All right, we're kind of wrapping up now. What do you guys love about your job? Like what, what is just the biggest thing you enjoy when you get to supervise a project? What's most satisfying? When you see it come together and it sounds beautiful and maybe even better than you imagined and creating some new friendships hopefully along the way too um, well i like as a supervisor the fact that i i can both work by myself and work with others it was kind of like equal time doing that um, which i really really enjoy because sometimes my creative juices really get flowing when i'm just in my little nook here um, working, but then when you're working with people, ideas will come fast and furious because people are bouncing ideas off of each other, or when you're shooting loop group or something, and 
they're a wealth of information too. And they'll come up with ideas that I didn't even know about um, or think about. And then what Annalise just said, just hearing the results of your work, you know, seeing it all come together. Um, and then th the other thing is, and I think about this all the time, is I always feel like no matter what I'm working on, this is somebody's baby. This is, you know, the writer, the showrunner, like this is something that's super important to them, you know, like really important to them. And I, and I try to treat everybody's project as if it were my baby, but I, but I really am mindful of the fact that like, um, I'm getting satisfaction out of making their dream come true. Uh, Katie, what about you? Uh, yeah, I think all the the collaboration that parts are always the bits I enjoy. When when they're going well, though, that said, sometimes they don't always go well. So, but when when it's going well and you you're on the final mix stage and it's all come together, it's just awesome. You'll feel part of a team, all of that, as well as yeah, when you can achieve. You know, like we've mentioned before, uh, that um, I think Mala mentioned it, where uh, you know the um, your filmmakers don't necessarily have a an audio language, and sometimes they can only sort of they can't really articulate what it will be in sound that they want. So you just end up doing all this stabbing in the dark, trying to find the thing that they want, because the adjectives that they're using to describe it, or or they're like, oh, I'll know when I hear it. And you're like, ah, oh, great. And so, you know, there you are stabbing away, stab, stab, stab in the dark, trying to get it a bit closer every time. And when you finally achieve it, and it's been something that you've been, um, you know, kind of banging your head against the wall for a while. When you finally achieve that, that feels pretty great. And you're like, oh, they liked it. <laughs> That's, that, that feels great because you finally, and then, you know, everybody's learned something in that process. And yeah. You have to check your ego at the door on any of that sort of stuff. Cause they'll be like, no, I don't really like that. Oh God, I just had like three people work for a week on that. Okay, sure, we'll try something else, you know. So, but if you can achieve what it is that your filmmaker has sort of has in their head for a vibe of something and you get that, feels great. Yeah, that's, that's got to feel really good. <laughs> what's um what's your number one advice for anyone looking to get into this? Don't be too precious about the stuff you create. It's okay um, for other people not to like what you're doing. Um, and even if it took you 4,500 hours to create this one tone if they want to mute it then you go in a very high-pitched voice like katie said sure <laughs> I know. And, but you just that's the one thing is it you know you are a facilitator in someone else's um mind's eye for what they want and it's okay to redo and do many versions and that's okay yeah, and I would just say um, for people wanting just to get their foot in the door and get in, um, the first piece of advice would be network, 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 you know, like keep in contact with us and meetup groups and Facebook groups and different uh, professional organizations. And also don't be afraid to start at the bottom, you know, getting coffee, being a runner, working the front desk, because like I think Anneli said earlier, if you try something too quickly, you know, you never have a second chance to make a, a first impression. So it's better that you wait a little bit longer, learn from other people's mistakes, really take it all in, you know, work on free stuff where like only says, if you, if you make a mistake, well, they're not paying you, so it's not a huge hairy deal, but be physically surrounded. Like I wouldn't, I mean, it's great people wait tables all the time. I mean, just to, to make a living, but if, but if you wanna do something, I think you really need to be in that environment. Um, so just take whatever you can to get your foot in the door, um, maintain your relationships, network, and learn on that job. And then doors will, will open. And the other thing I, 
I advise young people to do is tell people what it is you're interested in. Because a lot of times I find that I have to ask them, like somebody at the front desk, so what do you want to do? And, and they're shy and they don't want to impose on you. And it really isn't an imposition. There's a way of doing it so that you're not pestering somebody, but you're just letting them into your world and letting them know what it is you want to do. And if I know that, then I can kind of keep that in my mind. And if something comes up, even at a different facility, like, like I got um, a friend of a friend, a, a job as a receptionist at Technicolor, and now a gig opened up to be the sound librarian at Universal. And so she took that, but like, then you can have it in your head and help them out down the line, but you can't if you don't know what it is they wanna do. Okay. Yeah, and all I would add to all of that is just saying that um, you can't really, I mean, I think you could say it in a lot of industries, but I think you've got to make sure that you have a work ethic because it's, you know, there's a long hours and stuff. And yeah, sometimes it is amazing. You're like, wow, somebody's actually paying me to do this. But there's also a lot of times you do a lot of really dull stuff and you have to be prepared to do that and you have to want it enough because mm -hmm. otherwise you're wasting, you should put your energies into something you do like doing, you know, don't, don't waste time on sound post-production if you're, you really rather do something else. So you've got to have a work ethic that is applicable and that's because you like doing it enough. Mm -hmm. That's really good advice, thank you. Um, what, I'm just wondering, cause you mentioned networking, uh, Marla, how, how can our audience today reach you uh, for advice or stay in contact or see what you guys are up to? Uh, well, they can find me on Facebook or LinkedIn um, I don't do Instagram too much and my Twitter is all political. <laughs> so, <laughs> so that'd be for me. Me too. LinkedIn, Twitter maybe, but uh, Instagram. Yeah, same. Mm -hmm. LinkedIn, the professional way. Uh, oh, Instagram too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, this, um, this is really nice for you all to take your time and 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 tell us your stories and and your advice. Uh, really, really, really appreciate it. Really appreciate Carrie Kai's for uh, arranging this. Uh, shout out to Sue K Hill, uh, Ruth Edelman, and uh, Lauren Stevens who couldn't make it with a, uh, make it here today, uh, but they were here in spirit, of course. Um, and and thank you all for coming. Thank you for coming to. Uh, to support us and to watch us and to learn and um yeah this is this has been great welcome <laughs> thank you yeah, thank you guys thanks bye have a great day everybody bye <laughs>